A Horn Book for Witches, The Besom. When full gallop they would speed to a coven far away, thrifty witches use a steed economical, the broom. This asks neither stall nor groom, never runs a bill for hay. The familiar, mangy lean of evil fame, subject to her own dark laws, old Grimalkin tells her dame ancient lore that all cats know and their secret, how to show friendship while you flex your claws. The Magic Circle Here within this potent round, which, secure from harm, may stay. Safety lies in circles, bound in such mystic cipher goes earth and all the worlds. Who knows what grim shapes it keeps at bay? Enchanted Sleep Vivian the limmer lass, stepping from the fairy lake, bound Merlin in tree of glass with her cup of magic dwale. Now she lies, so ends each tale, in sleep of death no spell can break. Magician's Hat Like a steeple to the skies soared the occult headdress, once worn with pride by adept wise, Round the brim the zodiac whirled in scarlet thread, Alack, now this cap denotes the dunce. Witch's Wheel By the turning of this wheel, Faithfulness in hearts of men, Young enchantresses can seal. Circe long ago did hold such a toy, Yet we are told Ulysses never came again. The Spells there are words of awful might that each witch wife must be learning. If the runes are spoken right, fiends will hasten to obey. Let the tongue slip, neighbors may suddenly smell something burning. The coven, crossed legged on the sarsen stone, Satan sits with staghorn crown. Witches kneeling by his throne wonder at his mask in fear. Is it sin in person here? Likely just a clerk from town. The Covenant Writ on scroll of felon's skin with her blood for evil's sake is her name. Now she is kin to Pamphila, Ender, Bork. Lucifer will bless her work and reward her with the stake. Witches on the Heath Three witches danced on the heath last night, dancing widdishins round a tree. Wildly widdishins whirled the three under a wild and cloud-swept sky, while a goblin moon rode high over the hill where the old stones lie, and their hats were peaked, and they twittered and squeaked as they danced in the green moonlight. And out of the boughs of the twisted thorn came the wail of a violin, queer and evil and sad and thin. And though there was nobody one could see, somebody played in the twisted tree queer sad tunes for the witches three, till a lost wind crept from the hills and wept, and the farm cocks crowed up the moor. The Ballad of the Jabberwock My grandmother tells me when the lights are low, how the Jabberwock appeared in Squonkum long ago. First a frightened farmer tearing into town, told how his wife had seen something big and brown, horned like a billy goat and scaled like a dragon, perched cross-legged on their brand new wagon. It leaped into the barn and hid in the hay. She screeched blue murder and fainted away. The timmerman saw it coming from cross keys. It crept from Corkray's wood and peered round the trees. Footprints were found in fields, clawed like a bird's, 
It clumped over Karsh's roof, gibbering words. Then folks began to see it here and everywhere, clinging to the steeple, winging through the air, with vans of a mighty bat, or walking in a pasture upright as any man and cocky as a master. Squonkum locked all its doors and bright lamps were lit in chilly front parlors where folks seldom sit except for a funeral or the minister's call. But what lurks in darkness? They lighted up all. Some few were skeptical and would only smile, but the path to the barn that night seemed like a mile. Reverend Wolsey preached of sin, and most folks agreed that it was a warning they had better heed. They named it the Jabberwock, for want of another, but some shook their heads. It's the devil's own brother. Then people came to church who'd never been yet. Some patched up a quarrel and some paid a debt. Cousin Flo and Cousin Kate forgot they didn't speak, and old man Jones stayed sober for one amazing week. Wives left off nagging and husbands kissed their wives, the Claybrook brothers went to work for once in their lives. No one watered any milk or cut the measures down, and Tilly got religion, and all her girls left town. Then one day the town awoke to find it had fled. No one saw it squatting on his barn or shed. No one saw those footprints huge upon his lawn suddenly as it had come. The Jabberwock had gone. The church held a meeting, and great thanks were given that Satan had done his worst and left them scared but shriven. Satan had ramped about like a roaring lion, but Squonkum held firm, and now was a little Zion. They were the wonder town of the countryside. They had driven evil out. They let good abide for almost a fortnight. Then someone stole a sack of flour out of Barker's store, and Tilly's girls came back. All Saints' Eve Look, there beyond the window pane through the withered and rattling vine, a wee face spangled with silver rain, lovely and wan, stares in at mine, white as a shell upon the sands, where the black billows break and pass. Something is pressing tiny hands against the barrier of the glass. Something eerie and fey and pale is peering in from the haunted night. At our small room, snug from the angry gale, where faces glow in the firelight, slant strange eyes under sea-green hair, look wistfully in through the window pane. Quick, open the casement. What is there that cries in the wind and the streaming rain? It is gone. It has gone. There is nothing there, blown by the storm to our window pane. Only the night and the chill sea air and the voice of the sorrowful rain. Dreamland by a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Eidolon named Night on a black throne reigns upright. I have reached these lands but newly, from an ultimate dim thule, from a wild weird clime that lieth sublime, out of space, out of time. Bottomless vales and boundless floods and chasms and caves and titan woods with forms that no man can discover for the tears that drip all over. Mountains topping evermore into seas without a shore, 
Seas that restlessly aspire, surging unto skies of fire, Lakes that endlessly outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, Their still waters still and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the lakes that thus outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, Their sad waters sad and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the mountains near the river, murmuring lowly, murmuring ever, By the grey woods, by the swamp, where the toad and the newt encamp, By the dismal tarns and pools, where dwell the ghouls. By each spot the most unholy, in each nook most melancholy, There the traveller meets aghast, sheeted memories of the past, Shrouded forms that start and sigh, as they pass the wanderer by, white-robed forms of friends long given in agony to the earth and heaven, for the heart whose woes are legion is a peaceful, soothing region, for the spirit that walks in shadow tis, oh, tis an El Dorado, but the traveller travelling through it may not, dare not openly view it. Never its mysteries are exposed to the weak human eye unclosed. So wills its king who hath forbid the uplifting of the fringed lid, and thus the sad soul that here passes beholds it, but through darkened glasses, by a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Eidolon named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I have wandered home but newly from this ultimate dim viewly. The Sands of Dee. O oh, Mary, go and call the cattle home, and call the cattle home, and call the cattle home across the Sands of Dee. The western wind was wild and dank with foam, and all alone went she. The western tide crept up along the sand, and o'er and o'er the sand, and round and round the sand, as far as I could see. The rolling mist came down and hid the land, and never home came she. Oh, is it weed or fish or floating hair, a tress of golden hair, a drowned maiden's hair above the nets at sea? Was never salmon yet that shone so fair among the stakes on Dee? They rowed her in across the rolling foam, the cruel crawling foam, the cruel hungry foam, to her grave beside the sea. But still the boatmen hear her call the cattle home across the sands of Dee. Thus I refute Beelzy. There goes the tea bell, said Mrs. Carter. I hope Simon hears it. They looked out from the window of the drawing room. The long garden, agreeably neglected, ended in a waste plot. Here a little summer house was passing close by beauty on its way to complete decay. This was Simon's retreat. It was almost completely screened by the tangled branches of the apple tree and the pear tree, planted too close together, as they always are in suburbs. They caught a glimpse of him now and then as he strutted up and down, mouthing and gesticulating, performing all the solemn mumbo-jumbo of small boys who spend long afternoons at the forgotten ends of long gardens. There he is, bless him, said Betty. 
playing his game, said Mrs. Carter. He won't play with the other children anymore. And if I go down there, the temper, and comes in tired out. He doesn't have his sleep in the afternoons, asked Betty. You know what Big Simon's ideas are, said Mrs. Carter. Let him choose for himself, he says. That's what he chooses, and he comes in as white as a sheet. Look, he's heard the bell, said Betty. The expression was justified, though the bell had ceased ringing a full minute ago. Small Simon stopped in his parade exactly as if its tinny dingle had at that moment reached his ear. They watched him perform certain ritual sweeps and scratchings with his little stick and come lagging over the hot and flaggy grass toward the house. Mrs. Carter led the way down to the playroom, or garden room, which was also the tea room for hot days. It had been the huge scullery of this tall Georgian house. Now the walls were cream-washed. There was coarse blue net at the windows, canvas-covered armchairs on the stone floor, and a reproduction of Van Gogh's sunflowers over the mantelpiece. Small Simon came drifting in and accorded Betty a perfunctory greeting. His face was an almost perfect triangle, pointed at the chin, and he was paler than he should have been. The little elf child, cried Betty. Simon looked at her. No, he said. At that moment the door opened and Mr. Carter came in, rubbing his hands. He was a dentist and washed them before and after everything he did. You, said his wife, home already? Not unwelcome, I hope, said Mr. Carter, nodding to Betty. Two people cancelled their appointments. I decided to come home. I said I hope I am not unwelcome. Silly, said his wife, of course not. Small Simon seems doubtful, continued Mr. Carter. Small Simon, are you sorry to see me at tea with you? No, Daddy. No what? No, Big Simon. That's right, Big Simon and Small Simon. That sounds more like friends, doesn't it? At one time, little boys had to call their father sir, if they forgot a good spanking. On the bottom, small Simon, on the bottom, said Mr. Carter, washing his hands once more with his invisible soap and water. The little boy turned crimson with shame or rage. But now, you see, said Betty, to help, you can call your father whatever you like. And what, asked Mr. Carter, has small Simon been doing this afternoon while big Simon has been at work? Nothing, muttered his son. Then you have been bored, said Mr. Carter. Learn from experience, small Simon. Tomorrow do something amusing, and you will not be bored. I want him to learn from experience, Betty. That is my way, the new way. I have learned, said the boy, speaking like an old, tired man, as little boys so often do. It would hardly seem so, said Mr. Carter, if you sit on your behind all the afternoon doing nothing. Had my father caught me doing nothing, I should not have sat very comfortably. He played, said Mrs. Carter. A bit, said the boy, shifting on his chair. Too much, said Mrs. Carter. He comes in all nervy and dazed. He ought to have his rest. He is six said her husband. He is a reasonable being. He must choose for himself. But what game is this, small Simon, that is worth getting nervy and dazed over? There are very few games as good as all that. It's nothing, said the boy. Oh, come, said his father. We are friends, are we not? You can tell me. I was a small Simon once, just like you, and played the same games you play. Of course, there were no aeroplanes in those days. <laughs> With whom do you play this fine game? Come on, we must all answer civil questions or the world will never go round. With whom do you play? Mr. Beelzy, said the boy, unable to resist. Mr. Beelzy, said his father, raising his eyebrows inquiringly at his wife. It's a game he makes up, said she. Not makes up, cried the boy. Fool! 
That is telling stories, said his mother, and rude as well. We had better talk of something different. No wonder he is rude, said Mr. Carter. If you say he tells lies and then insist on changing the subject, he tells you his fantasy. You implant a guilt feeling. What can you expect? A defense mechanism. <laughs> then you get a real lie. Like in these three, said Betty, only different, of course. She was an unblushing little liar. I would have made her blush, said Mr. Carter, in the proper part of her anatomy. But Small Simon is in the fantasy stage. Are you not, Small Simon? You just make things up. No, I don't, said the boy. You do, said his father, and because you do, it is not too late to reason with you. There is no harm in fantasy, old chap. There is no harm in a bit of make-believe. Only you have to know the difference between daydreams and real things, or your brain will never grow. It will never be the brain of a big Simon. So come on, let us hear about this Mr. Bealsey of yours. Come on, what is he like? He isn't like anything, said the boy. Like nothing on earth, said his father. Oh, that's a terrible fellow. I'm not frightened of him, said the child, smiling. Not a bit. Well, I should hope not, said his father. If you were, you would be frightening yourself. I'm always telling people, older people than you are, that they are just frightening themselves. Is he a funny man? Is he a giant? Sometimes he is, said the little boy. Sometimes one thing, sometimes another, said his father. Sounds pretty vague. Why can't you tell us just what he's like? I love him, said the small boy. He loves me. That's a big word, said Mr. Carter, that might be better kept for real things like Big Simon and Small Simon. He is real, said the little boy passionately. He's not a fool, he's real. Listen, said his father, when you go down the garden, there's nobody there, is there? No, said the boy. Then you think of him inside your head and he comes. No, said Small Simon. I have to make marks on the ground with my stick. That doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Small Simon, you are being obstinate, said Mr. Carter. I am trying to explain something to you. I have been longer in the world than you have, so naturally I am older and wiser. I am explaining that Mr. Bealsey is a fantasy of yours. Do you hear? Do you understand? Yes, Daddy. He is a game. He is a let's pretend. The little boy looked down at his plate, smiling resignedly. I hope you are listening to me, said his father. All you have to do is to say, I have been playing a game of let's pretend with someone I make up called Mr. Bealsey. Then no one will say you tell lies and you will know the difference between dreams and reality. Mr. Bealsey is a daydream. The little boy still stared at his plate. He is sometimes there and sometimes not there, pursued Mr. Carter. Sometimes he's like one thing, sometimes another. You can't really see him, not as you see me. I am real. You can't touch him. You can touch me. I can touch you. Mr. Carter stretched out his big white dentist's hands and took his little son by the nape of the neck. He stopped speaking for a moment and tightened his hand. The little boy sank his head still lower. Now you know the difference, said Mr. Carter, between a pretend and a real thing. You and I are one thing. He is another. Which is the pretend? Come on, answer me. Which is the pretend? Big Simon and Small Simon, said the little boy. Don't, cried Betty, and at once put her hand over her mouth. For why should a visitor cry don't when a father is explaining things in a scientific and modern way? Besides, it annoys the father. Well, my boy, said Mr. Carter, I have said you must be allowed to learn from experience. Go upstairs, right up to your room. You shall learn whether it is better to reason or to be perverse and obstinate. Go up, I shall follow you. 
You're not going to beat the child, cried Mrs. Carter. No, said the little boy. Mr. Beelzey won't let him. Go on up with you, shouted his father. Small Simon stopped at the door. He said he wouldn't let anyone hurt me, he whimpered. He said he'd come like a lion with wings on and eat them up. You'll learn how real he is, shouted his father after him. If you can't learn it at one end, you shall learn it at the other. I'll have your breeches down. I shall finish my cup of tea first, however, said he to the two women. Neither of them spoke. Mr. Carter finished his tea and unhurriedly left the room, washing his hands with his invisible soap and water. Mrs. Carter said nothing. Betty could think of nothing to say. She wanted to be talking, for she was afraid of what they might hear. Suddenly it came. It seemed to tear the air apart. Good God, she cried. What was that? He's heard him. She sprang out of her chair, her silly eyes flashing behind her glasses. I'm going up there, she cried, trembling. Yes, let's go up, said Mrs. Carter. Let us go up. That was not small Simon. It was on the second floor landing that they found the shoe, with the man's foot still in it, like that last morsel of a mouse which sometimes falls unnoticed from the side of the jaws of the cat. The Water Ghost of Harrowby Hall The trouble with Harrowby Hall was that it was haunted, and what was worse, the ghost did not content itself with merely appearing at the bedside of the afflicted person who saw it, but persisted in remaining there for one mortal hour before it would disappear. It never appeared except on Christmas Eve. The owners of Harrowby Hall had done their utmost to rid themselves of the damp and dewy lady who rose up out of the best bedroom floor at midnight, but without avail. They had tried to stop the clock so that the ghost would not know when it was midnight, but she made her appearance just the same with that fearful miasmatic personality of hers, and there she would stand until everything about her was thoroughly saturated. Then the owners of Harrowby Hall caulked up every crack in the floor with the very best quality of hemp, and over this were placed layers of tar and canvas. The walls were made waterproof, and the doors and windows likewise, the proprietor having conceived the notion that the unexercised lady would find it difficult to leak into the room after these precautions had been taken. But even this did not suffice. The following Christmas Eve she appeared as promptly as before and frightened the occupant of the room quite out of his senses by sitting down alongside of him and gazing with her cavernous blue eyes into him. And he noticed, too, in her long, aqueously bony fingers, bits of dripping seaweed were entwined, the ends hanging down. At these ends she drew across her forehead until he became like one insane and then he swooned away and was found unconscious in his bed the next morning by his host, simply saturated with seawater and fright, from the combined effects of which he never recovered, dying four years later of pneumonia and nervous prostration at the age of seventy-eight. The next year the master of Harrowby Hall decided not to have the best spare room opened at all, thinking that perhaps the ghost's thirst for making herself disagreeable would be satisfied by haunting the furniture, but the plan was as unavailing as the many that had preceded. The ghost appeared as usual in the room, that is, it was supposed she did, for the hangings were dripping wet the next morning, and in the parlor below the haunted room a great damp spot appeared on the ceiling. Finding no one there, she immediately set out to learn the reason why, and she chose none other to haunt than the owner of Harrowby himself. She found him in his own cozy room, drinking whiskey, whiskey undiluted, and felicitating himself upon having 
foiled her ghost ship when all of a sudden the curl went out of his hair, his whiskey bottle filled and overflowed, and he was himself in a condition similar to that of a man who had fallen into a water butt. When he had recovered from the shock, which was a painful one, he saw before him the lady of the cavernous eyes and the seaweed fingers. The sight was so unexpected and so terrifying that he fainted, but immediately came to because of the vast amount of water in his hair, which trickling down over his face restored his consciousness. Now it so happened that the master of Harrowby was a brave man, and while he was not particularly fond of interviewing ghosts, especially such quenching ghosts as the one before him, he was not to be daunted by an apparition. He had paid the lady the compliment of fainting from the effects of his first surprise, and now that he had come to, he intended to find out a few things he felt he had a right to know. He would have liked to put on a dry suit of clothes first, but the apparition declined to leave him for an instant, until her hour was up, and he was forced to deny himself that pleasure. Every time he would move, she would follow him, with the result that everything she came in contact with got a ducking. In an effort to warm himself up, he approached the fire, an unfortunate move, as it turned out, because it brought the ghost directly over the fire, which immediately was extinguished. The whiskey became utterly valueless as a comforter to his chilled system, because it was by this time diluted to a proportion of ninety percent of water. The only thing he could do to ward off the evil effects of his encounter he did, and that was to swallow ten two-grain quinine pills, which he managed to put into his mouth before the ghost had time to interfere. Having done this, he turned with some asperity to the ghost and said, Far be it from me to be impolite to a woman, madam, but I'm hanged if it wouldn't please me better if you'd stop these infernal visits of yours to this house. Go sit out on the lake, if you like that sort of thing. Soak the water butt, if you wish. But do not, I implore you, come into a gentleman's house and saturate him and his possessions in this way. It is disagreeable. Henry Hardwick Oldorp, said the ghost in a gurgling voice, you don't know what you are talking about. Madam, returned the unhappy householder, I wish that remark were strictly truthful. I was talking about you. It would be shillings and pence, nay, pounds in my pocket, madam, if I did not know you. Well, it would be a species of nonsense, returned the ghost, throwing a quart of indignation into the face of the master of Harrowby. It may rank high and repartee, but any comment upon my statement that you do not know what you are talking about is flavors of irrelevant impertinence. You do not know that I am compelled to haunt this place year after year by inexorable fate. It is no pleasure to me to enter this house and ruin and middle you everything I touch. I never aspire to be a shower bath, but it is my doom. Do you know who I am? No, I don't, returned the master of Harrowby. I should say you were the lady of the lake or little Sally Waters. You are a witty man for your years, said the ghost. Well, my humor is drier than yours will ever be, returned the master. No doubt, I'm never dry. I am the water ghost of Harrowby Hall, and dryness is a quality entirely beyond my wildest hope. I have been the incumbent of this highly unpleasant office for two hundred years tonight. How the deuce did you ever come to get elected? asked the master. Through a suicide, replied the spectre. I am the ghost of that fair maiden whose picture hangs over the mantelpiece in the drawing room. I should have been your great, 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 great aunt if I had lived, Henry Hardwick Oglethorpe, for I was the own sister of your great-great-great-great-grandfather. But what induced you to get this house into such a predicament? I was not to blame, sir, returned the lady. It was my father's fault. He it was who built Harrowby Hall, and the haunted chamber was to have been mine. My father had it furnished in pink and yellow, knowing well that blue and grey formed the only combination of colour I could tolerate. He did it merely to spite me, 
and with what I deem a proper spirit, I declined to live in the room, whereupon my father said I could live there or on the lawn. He didn't care which. That night I ran from the house and jumped over the cliff and into the sea. That was rash, said the master of Harrowby. So I've heard, returned the ghost. If I had known what the consequences were to be, I should not have jumped. But I really never realized what I was doing until after I was drowned. I had been drowned a week when a sea nymph came to me and informed me that I was to be one of her followers forever afterwards, adding that it should be my doom to haunt Harrowby Hall for one hour every Christmas Eve throughout the rest of eternity. I was to haunt that room on such Christmas Eves as I found it inhabited, and if it should turn out not to be inhabited, I was, and am, to spend the allotted hour with the head of the house. I'll sell the place. That you cannot do, for it is also required of me that I shall appear as the deeds are to be delivered to any purchaser and divulge to him the awful secret of the house. Do you mean to tell me that on every Christmas Eve that I don't happen to have somebody in that guest chamber, you are going to haunt me wherever I may be, ruining my whiskey, taking all the curl out of my hair, extinguishing my fire, and soaking me through to the skin? demanded the master. You have stated the case, Oglethorpe. And what is more, said the water ghost, it doesn't make the slightest difference where you are. If I find that room empty, wherever you may be, I shall douse you with my spectral Here the clock struck one, and immediately the apparition faded away. It was perhaps more of a trickle than a fade, but as a disappearance it was complete. By St. George and his dragon, ejaculated the master of Harrowby, wringing his hands, it is guineas to hot cross buns that next Christmas there's an occupant of the spare room or I spend the night in a bathtub. But the master of Harrowby would have lost his wager had there been anyone there to take him up, for when Christmas Eve came again he was in his grave, never having recovered from the coal contracted that awful night. Harrowby Hall was closed, and the heir to the estate was in London, where to him in his chambers came the same experience that his father had gone through, saving only that being younger and stronger he survived the shock. Everything in his room was ruined, his clocks were rusted in the works, a fine collection of watercolor drawings was entirely obliterated by the onslaught of the water ghost, and what was worse, the apartments below his were drenched with water soaking through the floors, a damage for which he was compelled to pay, and which resulted in his being requested by his landlady to vacate the premises immediately. The story of the visitation inflicted upon his family had gone abroad, and no one could be got to invite him out to any function save afternoon teas and receptions. Fathers of daughters declined to permit him to remain in their houses later than eight o'clock at night, not knowing but that some emergency might arise in the supernatural world which would require the unexpected appearance of the water ghosts in this on nights other than Christmas Eve, and before the mystic hour when weary churchyards, ignoring the rules which are supposed to govern polite society, begin to yawn. Nor would the maids themselves have aught to do with him, fearing the destruction by the sudden incursion of aqueous femininity of the costumes which they held most dear. So the heir of Harrowby Hall resolved, as his ancestors for several generations before him had resolved, that something must be done. His first thought was to make one of his servants occupy the haunted room at the crucial moment, but in this he failed because the servants themselves knew the history of the room and rebelled. None of his friends would consent to sacrifice their personal comfort to his, nor was there to be found in all England a man so poor as to be willing to occupy the doomed chamber on Christmas Eve for pay. Then the thought came to the heir to have the fireplace in the room enlarged, so that he might evaporate the ghost at its first appearance, and he was felicitating himself upon the ingenuity of his plan when he remembered what his father had told him, 
how that no fire could withstand the lady's extremely contagious dampness. And then he bethought himself of steam pipes. These, he remembered, could lie hundreds of feet deep in water and still retain sufficient heat to drive the water away in vapor. And as a result of this thought, the haunted room was heated by steam to a withering degree, and the air for six months attended daily the Turkish baths, so that when Christmas Eve came, he could himself withstand the awful temperature of the room. The scheme was only partially successful. The water ghost appeared at the specified time and found the air of Harrowby prepared. But hot as the room was, it shortened her visit by no more than five minutes in the hour, during which time the nervous system of the young master was well nigh shattered, and the room itself was cracked and warped to an extent which required the outlay of a large sum of money to remedy. And worse than this, as the last drop of the water ghost was slowly sizzling itself out on the floor, she whispered to her would-be conqueror that his scheme would avail him nothing, because there was still water in great plenty where she came from, and that next year would find her rehabilitated and as exasperatingly saturating as ever. It was then that the natural action of the mind in going from one extreme to the other suggested to the ingenious heir of Harrowby the means by which the water ghost was ultimately conquered and happiness once more came within the grasp of the house of Oglethorpe. The heir provided himself with a warm suit of fur underclothing. Donning this with the furry side in, he placed over it a rubber garment, tight-fitting, which he wore just as a woman wears a jersey. On top of this he placed another set of underclothing, this suit made of wool, and over this was a second rubber garment, like the first. Upon his head he placed a light and comfortable diving helmet, and so clad, on the following Christmas Eve, he awaited the coming of his tormentor. It was a bitterly cold night that brought to a close this twenty-fourth day of December. The air outside was still, but the temperature was below zero. Within all was quiet, the servants of Harrowby Hall awaiting with beating hearts, the outcome of their master's campaign against his supernatural visitor. The master himself was lying on the bed in the haunted bedroom, clad, as has already been indicated, and then the clock clanged out the hour of twelve. There was a sudden banging of doors, a blast of cold air swept through the halls. The door leading into the haunted chamber flew open, a splash was heard, and the water ghost was seen standing at the side of the heir of Harrowby, from whose outer dress there streamed rivulets of water, but whose own person deep down under the various garments he wore was as dry and as warm as he could have wished. Ha! said the young master of Harrowby. I'm glad to see you. You are the most original man I've met, if that is true, returned the ghost. May I ask, where did you get that hat? Certainly, madam, returned the master courteously. It is a little portable observatory I had made just for such emergencies as this. But tell me, is it true that you are doomed to follow me about for one mortal hour, to stand where I stand, to sit where I sit? That is my delectable fate, returned the lady. We'll go out on the lake, said the master, starting up. You can't get rid of me that way, returned the ghost. The water won't swallow me up. In fact, it will just add to my present bulk. Nevertheless, said the master firmly, we will go out on the lake. But my dear sir, returned the ghost with a pale reluctance, it is fearfully cold out there. You will be frozen hard before you've been out ten minutes. Oh, no, I'll not, replied the master. I am very warmly dressed. Come. This last in a tone of command that made the ghost ripple. And they started. They had not gone far before the water ghost showed signs of distress. 
You walk too slowly, she said. I am nearly frozen. My knees are so stiff now I can hardly move. I beseech you to accelerate your step. I should like to oblige a lady, returned the master courteously, but my clothes are rather heavy, and a hundred yards an hour is about my speed. Indeed, I think we would better sit down here on this snowdrift and talk matters over. Do not, do not do so, I beg, cried the ghost. Let me move on. I feel myself growing rigid as it is. If we stop here, I shall be frozen stiff. That, madam, said the master slowly, seating himself on an ice cake, is why I have brought you here. We have been on this spot just ten minutes. We have fifty more. Take your time about it, madam, but freeze. That is all I ask of you. I cannot move my right leg now, cried the ghost in despair, and my overskirt is a solid sheet of ice. Oh, good kind Mr. Oglethorpe, light a fire, and let me go free from these icy fetters. Never, madam, it cannot be. I have you at last. Alas, cried the ghost, a tear trickling down her frozen cheek. Help me, I beg. I congeal. Congeal, madam, congeal, returned Oglethorpe coldly. You have drenched me in mine for two hundred and three years, madam. Tonight you have had your last drench. Oh, but I shall thaw out again, and then you'll see. Instead of the comfortably tepid general ghost that I have been in my past, sir, I shall be iced water, cried the lady threateningly. No, you won't either, returned Oglethorpe, for when you are frozen quite stiff, I shall send you to a cold storage warehouse, and there you shall remain an icy work of art forevermore. But warehouses burn! So they do, but this warehouse cannot burn. It is made of asbestos, and surrounding it are fireproof walls, and within those walls the temperature is now and shall forever be 416 degrees below the zero point, low enough to make an icicle of any flame in the world. Or the next, the master added with an ill-suppressed chuckle. For the last time, let me beseech you. I would go on my knees to you, old Thorpe. Were they not already frozen? I beg of you, do not do... Here even the words froze on the water ghost's lips, and the clock struck one. There was a momentary tremor throughout the ice-bound form, and the moon coming out from behind a cloud shone down on the rigid figure of a beautiful woman sculptured in clear, transparent ice. There stood the ghost of Harrowby Hall, conquered by the cold, a prisoner for all time. The heir of Harrowby had won at last, and today in a large storage house in London, stands the frigid form of one who will never again flood the house of Oglethorpe with woe and sea water. As for the heir of Harrowby, his success in coping with a ghost has made him famous, a fame that still lingers about him, although his victory took place some twenty years ago. And so far from being unpopular with the fair sex as he was when we first knew him, he has not only been married twice, but is to lead a third bride to the altar before the year is out.